Come to Fine Woodworking Live 2018, April 20th through 22nd in Southbridge, Massachusetts. Head on over to finewoodworkinglive.com for more information. Actually, Vic's talk this morning was a really good preamble to this class. I thought he was going to steal my thunder because he knows way more about hand planes and selling hand planes uh, than I ever do. But um, he certainly made a really good argument for why we need to get him up and running. Um, and also, fortunately, he sort of kind of left you hanging out to dry a little bit, too. You know, the whole part about, here's a plane sharp, look how good it works. It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and a miracle happened. Yes. Uh, so um, kind of what, what I wanted to cover, and, and that, is, that is really the case. As a hand plane, once you get it up and running, you do wonderful things with it, and that's one reason I wanted to talk about this today is because I love my hand planes. They do away with a lot of sanding, like Vic said, which I hate to do. Um, they can leave a beautiful, pristine finish. Um, and they're really, really fun. I mean, it's one of the really few aspects of woodworking that I sort of consciously think of as having fun. Dovetails, yeah, you cut them, but there's more stress usually than anything else. Hand planing is great. Um, <clears throat> The second reason I really want to talk about this is before I got up and running with hand planes, I spent a long time not using them. And it was, my first experience was a hand plane, was um, kind of starting out woodworking, had some nice walnut. I'd heard hand planes did really good things to wood. I pulled out a rusty old Stanley from my dad's toolbox, ran across a walnut and got more tear out than I had seen before or since. And so the hand plane went back in the toolbox and my opinion of them was just they're these antiquated tools that really don't do anything well um, and they really don't belong in a modern shop. So um, obviously there's a little bit of a stumbling block to getting up and running. The good news um, is that today versus 30 years ago, probably within all of our lifetimes, there are more high quality planes on the market today than there ever has been. So our choices for buying something new and getting it working really easy um, is, is really good. Um, not every plane, uh, if you go to a home center and spend 20 or $30 on a hand plane, it's gonna give you a lot of grief and you're never gonna get it up and running. Um, but uh, I would say like a gaggle of brands that are really serviceable, and I think this demonstration applies to is obviously uh, the Stanley Sweetheart line. Um, I would not, uh, Stanley sells other lines of planes, um, but the Sweetheart is the one that is in the category of the Lee Nielsen, the Veritas, Wood River by Woodcraft is a really good plane. Uh, Clifton makes a really fantastic plane as well. So all of these planes are going to serve you really, really well. And as Vic sort of suggested, <clears throat> um, even if the directions say the blade is honed and ready for use, it's not. Um, so as much as money as we want to spend on a hand plane, there's still some work we need to do to get the tool up and running. And that's like that's tough, it's a big stumbling block. If I buy a $300 router and put a $50 bit in there, I don't expect to have to take the router apart and put it back together before I can use it. <laughs> um, so with a hand plane, um, we gotta do some work to it. So in order to get up and running to where Vic was taking nice shavings, it's not a lot of work, but it's a really important work. It's one of those things where I think it's really, especially applies to hand tools and that's, um, you can buy a hand tool, but you don't really own it until you really get to know it and you really get it to do what you want it to do and you really build the confidence um, to take the tool to your work um, and have it give you the, the results that you want. So what I wanna talk about specifically is not rehabbing old Stanleys and flattening soles and buying aftermarket blades and all that good kind of stuff. Um, it's what do you do when you spend a good chunk of change on a good hand plane um, to go from the box to taking some good shavings and a little bit beyond. 
So every plane is probably gonna come in a plastic bag wrapped in some sort of paper and be covered in grease. And pretty much the first thing I wanna do is disassemble the plane. That can be a kind of a scary thing. There's that fear of, well, if I, I take it apart, I'm gonna ruin it. I'm not gonna be able to get it back together in the right order. Get out your cell phone, take a picture of it if you need to, to make sure the parts um, are sort of gonna get back to where they come from. Uh, in this case, for the Stanley, uh, I'm just taking off the lever cap, which holds the blade in place. I pull the blade out. The blade is gonna be screwed to your chip breaker. And everything is gonna be really gunky. You can use a solvent, naphtha, or mineral spirits to get rid of that grease if it's really heavy. I tend to just sort of like to wipe it dry because I do want that layer of oil on everything to prevent rust, especially if I'm in a, a basement where it's wet or unheated shop where the, the ranges in temperature can uh, cause a lot of rust to develop. Always the biggest surprise is how much oil is hiding between the blade and the chip breaker. And the answer is eh, just a little bit. Yeah, a lot. This particular plane has the bed or the frog basically milled into a single piece of uh, cast iron, so I can't take this off. In a regular hand plane, I would probably go through the extra step of pulling the frog off because there's gonna be some grease and gunk underneath there as well. On the Lee Nielsen's, there's three screws. I don't know if you can see that. Um, in the back there. This is a bedrock style hand plane based on a vintage Stanley plane. The benefit for this type of plane is that it allows us to move the frog front to back to adjust the opening without having to take the blade off. On a traditional Stanley Bailey plane, um, you'll see the rounded sides um, as opposed to the flat top. Whenever you see an uh, old Stanley plane with flat top sides, buy it. That's a bedrock plane. That is like the epitome of the old Stanley planes. If you see the rounded side, you actually have to take the blade off and do all your adjustments in here. Guess about where you want the frog, tighten it, put the blade back in, and then see what you've got. So the adjustments in the back of this style plane make it easy. So I would clean off all of this as well. There's a chance there might be some metal filings still left in there we want to get out, but I'm really not looking to do a major rehab at this point. just a little bit. Okay. So from this point on, you know, if you just want to throw a straight edge against the sole to see if it's flat. Um, on a new plane I'm spending a lot of money for, I don't expect to flatten the sole. If there's like a real big hollow in there, I'm gonna send it back, I'm gonna get an, another plane because it shouldn't be there. Um, one of the major expenses uh, that go into a hand tool like this, why you're spending $125, $225 versus 30 bucks for a hand plane um, is because the level of machining to get an accurate tool, it's time and labor. So sort of really in a tool what you're paying for is not a difference in materials as much as a difference in terms of uh, the care that went into machining. So flat sole, I'm not gonna worry about that. 
Um, one thing I do want to worry about and take care of, and this is probably one of the scariest things to do the more money that you spent for a plane. <clears throat> so I like to take a file and file off the really sharp corner around the edges. Um, they don't need to be sharp, and what happens is that sharp corner can get bonked, and if there's a little dent there, it actually raises a piece of steel on the sole, and as you hand plane, you'll get these little streaks going across that almost look like plane tracks, but they're actually dents that you're putting into the wood through those nicks. I'm glad the door is closed because I don't know if Vic would agree that we're supposed to be filing down his planes, but I do. And I'll probably do just a little bit more body work to this once we have the blade in place and our throat adjusted to where it needs to go. Um, you know, that's pretty good. If you want to hit it with some 220 sandpaper, you can. You can pass this around. That's sort of, that's an older plane that's been, um, the corners are cleaned up a little bit, but you know, the, the brand new planes will come with a pretty sharp knife edge. But that's kind of what I'm looking for. So really that's it, other than filing the sole and getting the gunk off. Uh, for the most part, that's the extent of getting a new plane ready to go aside from getting the blade sharp. And um, it's kind of the, the reasons why we tend to not run this type of article is that as the planes get better, there's less and less to do and a setup uh, article on hand planes really turns into a sharpening article, um, which is kind of a different animal. But that's where I want to spend the most attention on because as nice as this is, um, we're not gonna get the shavings we want until we get sharp. And as Vic mentioned, I like this line. Well, you know how to get sharp. It's like... So um, getting sharp is the key, not just to hand planes, uh, to every hand tool from chisels, uh, spoke shaves, scrapers. Um, fortunately, the back saw is the one tool I never sharpen. Um, why would anyone want to sharpen a handsaw? I don't know. So my definition of sharp in terms of getting in shavings is uh, an intersection of two flat and polished planes. So that means we'll get the bevel nice and polished, but if we don't work on the back too, any mill marks um, on the back will translate to that corrugated edge on the blade, unless we want a corrugated edge uh, for specific reasons, um, all it's going to do is compromise the type of shaving we're gonna get. It's gonna compromise um, the longevity of that edge that we do put on it. So getting the back of a plane iron flat and polished is the biggest investment you'll make in getting your hand plane up and running. <clears throat> Uh, up until fairly recently, uh, plane manufacturers kind of left it to our own devices to get nice and flat and polished. Because again, the, the flatter we go, the higher the polish we get, the more money it costs. But um, it's become such an important thing. Uh, Veritas does a tremendous job um, really flattening and, and polishing their backs. It looks sort of like a frosty matte finish, almost like it's not... Um, really flat, but I tend to consider that flat. Anything else, well, this is, is flat. There are definitely still machine marks on there. And they're just gonna be really, really slight lines running front to back. You getting that at all? Okay. 
So I want to get just the area adjacent to the cutting edge. I need to get rid of those. I don't need to get the whole thing flat. Um, and there's two things I'm going to do. The first thing I'm going to do is see how flat it is and how much work I have to do. And then assess if it's not flat, what option I want to take. And I do have a couple options uh, in terms of getting the back dressed. So, let me put this down here. So for sharpening, um, we need a way to get sharp. I like to use water stones. Water stones, they cut really, really quickly um, and they leave a really, really fine polish. The downside to water stones is they go out of flat as we use them. That's actually a good thing because as we use water stones, the um, matrix that's holding the abrasive particles wears away. So whenever we reflatten a water stone, we're basically creating a brand new stone. It's not like an oil stone that's gonna glaze over over time and stop cutting. So I have two sets of water stones. This is a set of Norton man-made water stones, and I work with three grits. I work with a thousand grit is the coarsest I go. Um, there is a 220, don't use the 220. These come in combination stones. It's a good way to save money. One of the stones will probably be a 220, 1000 grit. The 220 is too soft um, and too aggressive. There's nothing you can do with that except take a blade out of flat. So that's not gonna help you out. So I'll use a thousand, a 4,000 grit is my medium grit, and then an 8,000 is my polishing grit for Norton. Some folks, uh, including Lee Nielsen, their sharpening guru, tends to recommend just a 1,000 grit and an 8,000 grit. I like the 4,000 grit for a couple reasons. One is that it means I don't have to work as hard on the 8,000 grit to get rid of the coarse scratches from the 1,000, but it also comes in handy when we're putting a camber on the iron that um, Vic was talking about that's really important. And I'll talk more about that. So to flatten, the least expensive way to get flat with the water stone is 220 wet dry sandpaper. Uh, put it on glass or granite, spritz the glass, lay down the paper, spritz it again with water, and flatten away. And the idea is that if you keep your stones flat, uh, getting them flat is a really fast process. This is a diamond plate. It's a coarse diamond plate made by DMT. It's called a dia flat. It's actually designed to flatten stones. Um, it's more expensive than just a regular coarse DMT and they work fine as well. Uh, the dia flat supposedly is manufactured to last longer and not wear down quite as quickly under the abrasive qualities of, of a sharpening stone. Um, I've used both for a number of years. I've had this one for probably five or six years and it's still holding up. So what I'm looking for is a nice flat, even color on the stone. That means I'm flat, that's a good thing. Like how would you know it's not, it's not doing its job anymore? Um, it just takes too long. Where did you get this stone holder? Yeah. It's awesome. I know. <laughs> it's a Norton, made by Norton. It looks like a fishing tackle box. I got it just for traveling. Um, there's a lower tray that holds all my junk in it. Oh, over here. And then there's a water well here, and of course my three-sided guy. Um, the good thing is it is it, it's a really self-contained. I don't have a plumbing in my shop, so um, this is basically what I use to sharpen. Water stones need to be soaked before use, so rather than so having them dry out and soaking and waiting 10 or 15 minutes to sharpen, they live in here. The really fine stones do not need to be soaked because they're very non-porous. So usually my 8,000 grit stone, it lives at the top where it doesn't need to be soaked. And not coincidentally, it's the last stone I use in sharpening, so without even thinking about it, that's just where it stays. You can see there that needs to be flattened. And um, using a diamond plate, 
you know, if I can't get rid of that quickly, I know this is not doing its job. So for flattening the back, we're removing a lot of material. And because of that, we're putting a lot of wear on the sharpening stone. And so the problem with water stones is that as I'm trying to get flat, if my stone is starting to dish out, I'll end up with a concave surface on the back of the plane, which is really difficult for the harder, finer stones to get rid of. It's, we're really sort of creating a problem that, that probably wasn't there to begin with. My other set of stones are Shapton stones uh, with a glass back. Um, it's a thin layer of ceramic backed by a sheet of glass. Um, they're a little more expensive than the Norton. It looks like it's not a good value because there's very little sharpening medium there. But these stones are fired um, to be the, the binder, the clay that's holding the grits in place is much harder. So they're very, uh, slow wearing and they're less prone to dishing out. So you're really flattening them less than this type of stone. Um, they work well. The other thing is because these are very non-porous, you don't have to soak them. Just spritz them with water and go. The only difference, and I found out the hard way, is that uh, Norton stones and Shapton stones are not graded exactly the same. And that I have a 1,000, 4,000, 8,000 for Norton. <coughs> So I bought a 1,000, 4,000, 8,000 of Shapton. And I found that the 8,000 grit was leaving coarser scratches than my Norton was. And I did some research and did find out that, yeah, even though it says 8,000, it's actually coarser. So if you're buying uh, Shapton stones, I would recommend getting 1,000, 5,000, 10,000. Um, and because I already had the eight, I ended up uh, getting a 16,000 grit stone, which sounds really cool. So if you want a 16,000 grit stone, I think they even have 30,000. Um, this just gives me a polish. It's actually, you know, the 8,000 lives somewhere between my eight and 16,000 Shapton. But because this is pretty expensive, I think I would probably go one, five, 10. Uh, so I flattened my 4,000 grit. I don't want to take my plain iron to my 1,000 grit because it's too soft. And when I am working the back of this blade, what's really important is I don't want to stay in one area of the stone. I want to work across the stone, work across the other half of the stone. Once I've worked the way all the way across, I'm going to reflatten the stone. It sounds like a lot of work, but again, uh, flattening the back is a one-time thing for any tool, whether it's a chisel or a plain iron. So the important thing is I'm keeping really, really dead flat, and I'm just working my way down one face. The downside to this sort of holder is because the stone is clamped in place, I can only use one face, which means I have to flatten it twice as often. Normally I flatten both faces, flip it, and I normally have sort of four areas to sharpen before I have to flatten again. Oh, so it's not a quick clamp mechanism to get the stone in? Yeah, no, it's screws. Oh, okay. what, what would be a, a similar grit to a thousand grit stone and sandpaper? Um, I would probably say 220, give or take. Because I generally sharpen to about 400 or 800 grit. On sandpaper? Yeah. I'd go to at least 1,200 grit, maybe even 2,000 grit on sandpaper. And that actually, um, can we see that? How it's, it's duller and it looks like it's getting rid of those scratches pretty well. So if I can start to address those scratches with my 4,000 grit, um, that's really good because I can get that flat without a lot of work. So Mike, you said you don't start with a thousand. No, never on a thousand. If I really want to flatten something, like let's say it's a used chisel or something like that, I'll go with uh, like 220 grit sandpaper, uh, just spray mount it uh, onto a piece of glass because that's going to stay a lot flatter. And we can get some really coarse work done. 
So in terms of the direction, um, sideways or front, or are you going at an angle? Uh, I'm going kind of this way across. So holding at an angle back and forth. So with that polished, um, the thing is that that little sort of haze that the 4,000 grit leaves, it may give the impression that all the scratches are gone. When we go to polish that to 8,000, if they show back up, just go back to 4,000. So we'll, I'm going to go ahead and flatten. So you're getting the back to a, your registration surface, but it's not it's not necessarily to to go against the whole bed of the of the plane. Uh, no, it has nothing to do with going against the plane because it's it's um, it's flat. I'm, it's really flat. All we're doing is getting scratch free without taking it out of flat. And except for one little, uh, little deep gouge line in there, um, we're back to flat. So again, you know, the notion of flattening water stones, that is, can kind of be kind of scary in and of itself. Um, it's just not that big of a deal. Because the 8,000 grit stone is harder, um, I can go back and forth more frequently uh, than the softer grits uh, without the worry of getting flat. So I'm bringing up a pretty nice polish. Are we getting that, Jeff? It's really like sort of within an eighth of an inch of the blade itself. Um, that's good. A lot of times, if I have a big hollow or a hump, and I'm going to spend a really long time doing this, I can take a different approach. It's called the ruler trick, and this is actually an approach that um, is advocated by Lee Nielsen with their hand planes because they want you to get up and running with their tools so you're happy with them. So rather than remove all that steel, so on a brand new blade, you throw a little skinny ruler down on the edge of the stone. And it just kicks it up. So you can see that line of swarf or shavings just from the tip of the blade. It's sort of like when you hone at a steeper, steeper angle than when you grind. And so all that work I did on the 4,000, that's done. I did that on the four. The first time, the only time I do that on a four is on a brand new blade. After that, I'll only touch it up on the 8,000 grit. And that goes for any tool. Once I get the back polished, I'm never touching the back. Uh, with anything but that finest grit stone that I used to create that polish. So that's it. This thing could have been horribly out of flat in five minutes and I'm ready to go. So that's the ruler trick. Um, hand planes, it's good. Never do that on chisels. Yes, sir. I've got Norton set of seven Norton stones and I bought that, but it came with a combination of the 1,000 and 8,000. Okay. And my 8,000 is yellow. Yeah. Is it, is it different? Would it be a different stone? Uh, it's, your this is just older. Okay. They ran out of thread. <laughs> this is the, yeah, this is the collector series. That's just the binder color, right? That's, yeah, that's exactly. Color. It's probably known by the state of California to cause cancer. Everything is. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, People were chewing their thumb, huh? And speaking of the hardness of the stones, you can see how thick that 8,000 grit stone is. Uh, you can see how thin my 4,000 is. They both started out exactly the same thickness. The 
Okay, so the back is done. Whether um, it was close enough to go through the effort of polishing it flat, that will make sharpening easier in the long run. So if you can make that effort, uh, it means we don't have to use that ruler. The first time that I introduce the ruler to the back of it, I have to use that every single time I resharpen. And it's not that big of a deal. Um, I use the ruler trick pretty much on every single plain iron without exception. Um, it's faster and sort of, again, once, once you do it, I'm sort of locked into it. The other thing is that um, most plain iron, plain manufacturers have moved from a high carbon steel blade, an O1 steel, to an A2. This is an A2 blade. I think uh, all Veritas and Lee Nielsen planes uh, come shipped with A2 blades. Um, they're good because the edge lasts a lot longer. Because that steel is a lot tougher, abrasion resistant, um, it makes it harder to sharpen because that's what we're doing is abrading that steel on the stones. And I always found that um, I could get my O1 steel blades sharper than my A2 steel blades. And when I went to using the ruler for the back, um, it allowed me to get sharper, easier on A2 steel. So that's the main reason why I use it on all my tools. But um, again, on a, on a plane where they've done a good job flattening and made that investment, I kind of don't want to disrespect that just yet. So to sharpen the bevel, <clears throat> I like to use a honing guide. Um, probably the, the most economical approach to honing guides. It's a generic side clamping guide. You get them for 14 or 15 bucks from any woodworking catalog. The blade sits in place. Depending how far out the blade projects will determine at what angle we're sharpening. And the key about sharpening over the long run is not that we're locking it into an exact angle, but that the, we can be really consistent so that we're not changing the angle and removing a lot of steel every time we sharpen. So for this tool, there are some cryptic writing on there. 30 millimeter projection equals 30 degrees. Um, I don't have a ruler that measures in millimeters. So you can get out a protractor and set it. Um, if you have a really cool Wixi digital angle gauge, you can use that. So let's try to zero that out approximately. We can throw that on there. Oh, and I'm looking for 30 degrees. Uh, most plain irons come ground at 25 degrees. Uh, so by going up to 30 degrees, it's sort of like putting the ruler on the back. I'm polishing just that front edge, and that lets me get sharp really, really fast. So rather than pulling this out every time, you can take your plain iron once it's in place, run it up against the block, glue on a block, and then mark what you've got going on there. So I've got my 30 degree, 25 degree. I'm going to reset it to this block because that was a little bit off. And uh, okay. Difference in your micro edge or micro bevel? So I um, I don't change the angle in which I hone. I grind at one angle, which is 25 degrees. So basically, that's what they've already done for me. I do all my honing at 30 degrees through all of my grits. I don't change that. I know that Veritas has that little cam wheel on the side of their sharpeners, which lets you kick it up a degree every time. Um, I don't see the benefit of that. So because this is ground at 25 degrees and I'm honing at 30, that means the tip of that iron is in contact with my stone. My stone is pretty soft. And if I push right away, that stone can catch, it can, uh, the blade can catch, it can gouge the stone and it can sort of ruin our edge. So instead, at least for the few strokes, I wanna start on the pull stroke. And then I can go back and forth a little bit. 
and what I'm looking for is a continuous line of polish. Nice work, Jeff. So it's only about maybe not even a 32nd of an inch wide, but what I'm looking for is that it's continuous all the way along the, the length of the tip of the blade. Cool. And the second thing I can do is run my finger back to front, and I should feel a really light burr. That just means that that steel is being braided all across the edge. That's it. I don't want it really wide because the narrower it is, the quicker it is to get that sharp again. And I can hone usually three or four or five times before that bevel gets so wide that I need to grind, reestablish that 25 degree grind. That's going to become a problem, isn't it? <laughs> and, and how do you do that? You... Uh, that's a really good question. So here is a plain iron, which I've honed quite a bit. And you can see that bevel is about half the width of that uh, primary bevel. I'm removing a lot of steel when I sharpen now. I need to reestablish that 25 degree. Um, there's no simple best answer to reestablish that. The least expensive is to get a piece of 100 grit sandpaper on granite, set up your honing guide to 25 degrees, and go at it. It's really slow, but you'll get to where you need to go. And you don't need to go all the way to the tip. You just need to get that secondary bevel back to skinny again. So whenever I'm doing that, I tend to not uh, do that. Um, the second option, which is really fast, but poses some risks, is a grinder, you know, with the two grinding guys. So you have a grinder, you, know, you want to use a white wheel, a friable wheel, which is going to break down and keep the steel cooler. You need to get some sort of a tool rest on there to maintain the angle. You have to develop a technique um, to get a hollow grind even across the, the, the width of the blade without burning anything. If you discolor the steel, you're pulling the temper out, and now that's a soft steel um, that is not going to hold its edge until you grind your way past that. So really slow and safe, really fast and risky. Um, I use a a uh, water wheel, a uh, Tormek, which is a big round water stone that spins around. It has a really good tool rest that locks, lets me lock in the angle. I can slide my blade across it. It does a perfect job. It gives me a perfect hollow grind. It's a thing of beauty. <coughs> it's really expensive comparatively. So you're looking at, I don't know what the cheapest model is, probably around $500 or so, on up to seven-ish. So, and I only use it for that primary grind. And it's the, so I don't know what the answer is. I have a Tormac. I love it. Um, I don't want that to be a stumbling block, so I would say if you're starting out, use coarse sandpaper on glass and just spend the time to get back to 25 degrees. Is there any cheap glass you pick up at Home Depot wide enough for this one? Um, I would get, a lot of times you got to go find their, uh, the shelf glass, which is thicker. Um, usually it's over in that weird bathroom outfitting section, not by the cabinets, but over sort of by the curtains kind of thing. Um, you can also use granite. They, and at Home Depot, they have those 12 by 12 sort of half inch thick granite. I expected those to be flat. I actually bought one that was not flat at all. Maybe a kitchen top remnant would be good or Woodcraft sells them. They're not horribly expensive for a nice, thick, flat granite stone. They're heavy, so if you have a wood craft that you can pick it up instead of have to have it shipped, that's a good thing. I, I worked in the glass industry for a long time. as a professional glazer for 12 years. Cool, You've okay. Got a glass shop locally. Yeah. A lot of times you can go and they have taken out an old storefront or glass shelving out of some place and they have strap pieces that they're just gonna throw out anyway. And more often than not, they're just as happy to give you a you know, okay. a four-inch by 12-inch piece that will do the job. Is so, there a minimum thickness that you have? Three-eighths. Okay. It would, I mean, if you can find a piece of, piece of three-eighths plate, yeah. it's flat. Cool. This, uh, this glass here, um, I rescued a oval coffee table top from my dump and cut it up, and that was kind of nasty, but I have lots of these around now. Okay.
So I got my 1,000 grit. I just flattened my 4,000 grit. I'm going to do the exact same process. And I'm basically, all I'm doing now is getting rid of those 1,000 grit scratches. I'm just refining that scratch pattern. That's all. So I don't want to go too far. Just a couple back and forth. And I'm going to trust that those are gone. We may or may not see a difference in the quality of the sheen. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I don't want that, that honed bevel to get too wide. However, this is where I want to impart the camber, the really slight curve on the blade. A lot of times we think of camber, we think of a scrub plane, of a really dish blade, something we can see or we grind that curve on there. What I'm talking about is the shaving we want to take is somewhere between a thousandth of an inch thick to two thousandths at the very thickest for a smoothing plane. So that camber needs to be, you know, roughly to where it cuts the full width in the center, gets me almost full width without the corner touching. So we're talking thousands of an inch of camber. Um, it's not anything you can really see, um, not anything you can measure. The way I put it in is just by keeping uh, the blade flat on the stone and just pressuring one side for a couple passes and then pressure the other side for a couple passes. I'll move that back. Sure. And we should be able to see if I clean this off a little bit. It should be pretty apparent by the steel that's going to be coming off of this um, where I'm doing the honing. So if I'm pushing down on the right, I can see that steel coming off. Okay. Are you doing it with all the iron or just smoothing? Um, I do this with just a smoothing plane. Any plane for joinery, block plane, shoulder plane, um, dead flat. Uh, I kind of treat both my four and my five almost interchangeably. So I put a very slight camber on both of those planes. So I'll do the right, I'll do the left a couple times. And there's no precise way to measure it depending on the hardness of the steel of your blade, depending on the aggressiveness of your stone. I do a couple few times on each side and then uh, We'll finish sharpening, throw it into the plane, and see how it cuts. If it gives me a really skinny shaving, and that by the time it's wide enough, it's really heavy in the middle, there's too much. If it's impossible for me to adjust the plane without a corner digging in, there's not enough camber on there. That's what I like about having the 4,000 grit, is that the 1,000 is going to put way too much too easily for me. The 8,000, because it's so hard and so fine, I'm just not going to get the camber that I want from there. So you're only doing the camber now. You've done the whole thing flat and straight across, and then you go back through the sequence. Yeah, so 4,000 grit straight across to remove all the 1,000 grit, pressure the sides. 8,000, I'm repeating the exact same process, dead flat, to remove the 4,000 grit scratches in the center. And now I'm going to alternate the pressure on each side. I'm not lifting up. It's really, it's literally just pressuring that edge of the blade. I think I read somewhere that some of the coding guides, maybe one of the um, Veritas, the, the wheel is so wide that yeah. you're not really accomplishing anything. Yeah, the Veritas Mark II is a great, great um, uh, sharpening system. The problem is their wheel is almost two inches wide and it's dead flat. It's really hard for me to put a camber there. They do sell a barrel shaped wheel, which I really like, and you can do the same thing. Here I'm just relying on the fact that it's a skinny wheel on uh, the Lee Nielsen guide, oh, which is really nice. It's the same thing, skinny wheel. So we can probably see a really slight arc to that, maybe, where it's a little wider on the edges than the center. That's really an exaggeration of the amount of camber we have, but it is a visual indicator that we have some on there, because that's really just the, the intersection of two similar angle surfaces. Uh, so it's just going to exaggerate that curve. So I still have the burr on the back. I'm just holding this, the blade dead flat. This is where not using the ruler makes it easier here because I can leave it in the honing guide. Sometimes you, you kind of chase that wire edge a little bit and then go back. If I'm using the ruler, the ruler goes on. I'll leave it in the honing guide. I'll bring the, the honing guide up against the ruler and do that. And then I can go back and forth. 
and it will leave a little bit of a score line in your stone, which you probably saw. That's what that was caused from. So not using the ruler, um, you got to invest on getting the back really flat. And if I'm not talking and not goofing around, literally it takes more time to get the blade out of the plane than it does to get it sharp. Okay, so we got a degreased plane, a filed bottom, a sharp edge, and let's take a shaving and see if we did what we were supposed to be doing. Any questions to this point? Did you put an oil or a wax or anything on the blade? Um, if I'm using oil, I'll use a um, camellia oil just as a slight rust preventer. It is really important to get it really dry before you put it back together. Yes. Is that, a, is that what you just made, a bevel side up or a bevel side down uh, sharpening? Um, well, I'm sharpening the bevel, and I'm going to sharpen any plane exactly the same way, regardless of how the blade is bedded. Do you have a preference? Of planes? No. Which direction they, they go? Well, it depends on the, on the, the design of the plane. Um, this is a bevel up smoothing plane. So this blade is designed to be bevel up. It has to be. It won't work if it isn't. Um, for a standard style plane, it has to be beveled down. Otherwise, it won't work. So we can't, um, we can't change that around. I'm not sure if that was your question or not. OK. OK. Um, so the first thing in getting everything back together is I want to get my chip breaker back in place. And the chip breaker, it's really, it's not really a properly named um, part of the plane. It is if we're taking really thick shavings, the idea that steeper angle of the chip breaker, the shaving comes up, it hits that, it cracks, so instead of levering and tearing out, um, it breaks off. Chip breaker. However, the shavings that we're going to take are so thin and so pliable, there's no breaking going on by the chip breaker. That said, it does um, play a really important role in the performance of the plane. And that has to do with the fact that um, as the lever cap goes back on, the, the tip of the lever cap is maybe 3 quarters of an inch behind the tip of the blade. So that means it's being held down, especially on a thinner blade, it's being held down pretty far back from the tip of the blade so that can flex and give us chatter, especially on older, thinner blades. So really what that chip breaker is doing is it's transferring the downward pressure of our lever cap right up to the front of the blade. So that's a long way of saying, don't worry about getting it too close. There's this notion of, man, if I get it like right there, I'm gonna get these accordion shavings and no tear out. Um, I don't find that that enhances the results that I get with the plane. And the closer you try to get, the more you risk that chip breaker sliding over and destroying that edge that you've just owned. So I'd say anywhere. I call it like a fat 30 second of an inch. Oh, yeah, so the chip breaker, it needs to um, be bedded really well. On new style planes, they typically have a thicker chip breaker with a hard bevel instead of the old sort of spring style thing. And again, just like the flatness of the sole on a good quality plane, I really don't have to do much to that. I can polish that front edge of the chip breaker a little bit just to make it look nicer, maybe to give you less something or other on there. But at this point, I'm gonna say that this is good. What I don't want on old style chip breakers is I wouldn't want a gap at the front that blades, that uh, shavings could get stuck into. So to go back into the plane, I like to hold the plane so that my bed is level. So I'm not dropping the blade into the plane. I can rest it on my flat bed and engage the little cutter. 
I tend to center it as best as I can and center my lateral adjuster as much as I can. And on this style of lever cap, it has a screw to tighten and apply the pressure. I believe that's the same with the Veritas style low angle, uh, same thing. For the traditional style plane, it's more of that kind of that lever. So I'm looking for, you know, it, it needs to give a little bit of a shove. Vic's description of tight enough to hold the blade in place while allowing you to make adjustment is pretty good. Um, this type of adjuster is kind of a two-in-one adjuster, similar to the Veritas adjusters. It's called a Norris style adjuster, meaning if I twist it, I'm going to move the blade in or out. And if I angle it, I'm gonna angle the blade. The traditional Stanley style, the Lee Nielsen style, I am dividing those two things into two separate tasks. I have a wheel to go in and out. I have a level adjuster to go left and right. Um, it's a matter of preference. Um, I tend to like to split them up into two different tasks, but they both work well. And I'm not sure I'm not sure that would be a deciding factor on the, on the plane that I got. So I want to get my blade roughly set up. Um, Vic does this, and a lot of people do this. I have no idea what they're looking at. I can't see anything. Um, I, I trust my fingers. I, I keep a finger on either corner, and as I'm bringing out the blade, if I feel it sticking out, I can feel the corner here, but not here. So I'm just moving my adjuster toward the corner that's sticking out until it doesn't stick out anymore. So how much tension do you have on the blade when you're doing that? Is it all clamped down? Yeah, it's, it's full tension. And in this case, it's even, but it feels like it's projecting out a little bit too far. That's the, the, the struggle I have with the all-in-one is that if I'm trying to adjust a lateral adjustment, sometimes the depth adjustment changes at the same time. And really, I think the primary um, function of a plane in terms of its usability is the ability to set the plane iron exactly where you want it, because we're talking about thousands of an inch shavings. So we're talking about really very, very small adjustments. So two ways to set the throat or the opening of the mouth. Um, in the standard style, we're moving the frog front to back. On most block planes, um, the Veritas bevel up planes, and the Stanley Sweetheart, there's the front of the sole actually moves front to back. And for a smoothing plane, none of my planes are dedicated single use planes for the most part. So even though I want to be taking really fine shavings, um, and the, the tighter the mouth, the more those shavings are compressed right ahead of the blade, the less they're gonna lift and tear up. So I want it really tight, but at the same time, if I ever wanna take a slightly deeper cut, I don't wanna to have to readjust everything, especially a moving frog, in order to keep the chips from clogging. So I'm gonna set it for, I'm gonna say sort of like a skinny 30 second. And if ever my shavings get that thick, um, probably not doing something right. And once I do that, make sure the blade comes out. Open it up just a little bit. Here's the other um, sort of fine tuning I do on the, on the sole of something like this. And I've done it on this plane. I do it on my block plane. Um, with the movable throat is chances are by the time I get this set where I want it um, It's inset a little bit and they have these little devil ears on either side Sticking out and they're really really sharp and they can inadvertently gouge into your stock a little bit So once I get the mouth where I want it I'll file those down can see that difference there just enough so that 
where the plane is hitting the wood, it's nice and even as opposed to having a sharp little peak sticking out there. So it's not a lot of steel. I'm not coming in flat. I'm just sort of beveling that bottom so that it's a continuous arc just at the bottom there. So when I'm checking with my fingers to set the depth of the blade, I'm setting it to where it's even and I can just barely feel it. And that, that means it's, it's getting close to cutting, but it's not cutting yet. And that's what I wanna do because um, if I'm sitting there making a lot of adjustments and the blade is really retracted in, I'll take a pass, move it, take a pass, move it. After about the 20th time I do that, I start to take heavier and heavier turns until all of a sudden I go from not cutting to cutting too much. And by taking too heavy of a shaving, we really sort of defeated the purpose of getting sharp to begin with. Because the whole point in being sharp for hand plane is that the, sh the thinner the shaving we take, the less tear out we're gonna get. The sharper we are, the thinner we can go. And what I'm looking for is that first shaving um, I want that to be centered. Chances are it's going to be coming off to one side or the other. Oh, okay. So that's my first shaving. And it's like, eh, that's actually kind of pretty close. I think I got kind of lucky there. Normally this will offer um, a second fine tuning for the lateral adjustment once I really know where it's at. That's kind of close enough to center where I'm going to take some more shavings. Um, so that's my method. And so the, the type of shaving I'm looking for is a shaving that wiggles a little bit. Um, if you have a shaving that crinkles, you're probably thick enough where you're gonna be getting tear out. Um, so your, your shavings should wiggle. If you squish them, they shouldn't crinkle. They should just like compress. So that means you're within about a thousand to two thousandths of an inch. That's where you wanna be. And what I'm doing is I'm getting this flat because only when it's flat, I'll have a better sense of how it's cutting because as I'm sort of going over a flat surface, I'm gonna be a little bit hit and miss. So the shaving I'm taking here, you can see it's about maybe two thirds the width of the blade and the center is about the right thickness. So my, I kind of guessed right on that camber. And that's what I'm looking for. If it were really, really skinny, um, it just means it's set up for a heavier shaving. I use the finger trick. Vic does this. A lot of people recommend using a little a short block of wood and they'll just run it on each side to see if it's, it's making a cut. The benefit of this is you're not um, letting possible undulations of the board give you a false reading. Because the problem is if you have a really uneven board and you set it for an appropriate cut before it's flat, by the time you get flat, your cut is too heavy. So a lot of people use this method. Um, again, Denim from Lee Nielsen recommends this. Bob Van Dyke at his school recommends this. I don't use it myself, so I tend not to demonstrate, but I wanna tell you about it. So if you are having problems with your lateral adjustment or seeing if you're getting it set without taking too heavy of a cut, try a little piece of wood like that. Any questions about any of that? Yeah. 
does the compression of the chip breaker and the and it all sitting in the frog does that create a camber as well? No, uh, the question about the chip breaker holding it down only because on new planes uh, the irons are so thick. This is like an eighth inch thick iron and it's really bedded flat that just the pressure of that lever is not deforming that blade at all. All of that camber came from actually uh, pressuring either side while I'm honing it. The other thing about getting your hand plane up and running is, you know, what are we doing with it now that it's sharp? <clears throat> so what I'm using here, it's a simple uh, hook stop with a small fence on there. And I plane a lot of small work like this, drawer sides, It's pine, so we can go a little bit more aggressive. So the reason why I like using a bench stop instead of a vise is that I don't have to clamp and then clamp everything every time I want to plane a different face, and it's a lot faster this way. And on skinny parts, it can be difficult to plane a 90 degree angle edge on everything. Um, if I'm trying to clamp this up and trying to secure my plane that way, but I find on a little shooting board like this, I can just plane the, hold the plane flat on the bench top, and it does a really good job of getting me nice and flat and square. I use a similar thing for longer stock. It's basically the same thing. I can clamp it into an end vise or pinch it between bench dogs. Yeah. Does that really matter? Or do, is that just the way that you've been sort of doing it forever? When you put it down on the bench, then it's... Is that... <laughs> Yeah, as opposed to coming back. Well, one reason when I'm using a stop, it's really only keeping the, the board from going the direction I'm planing. If I don't lift up, I end up pulling the whole thing back. Yeah, I, I don't mind coming back. I do get in the habit, well, I'll tend to lift up the back and just the sole stays on the front. Um, I guess I, I am more concerned about lifting on the back stroke. And again, having this elevated, even on, on thicker stock. My vice doesn't stick up like that. It's a little bit easier to plane the edges that way. What I don't use these for are planing the ends of the boards because I want to get something that number one, I can adjust to make sure it's really square. And number two, it's something that's going to give me a little more backing to prevent blowout. On something like this, if I were to plane the ends of this board, because the fence is so low, I'm going to get a lot of tear out there. So I use a dedicated shooting board. It's a little bit different in that it's just two layers of plywood glued up and it creates a lip uh, for my plane to ride on. It's just so it's not bumping around on the surface of the board. It also has a fence which is attached by a pin on one side and a little quarter 20 star knob on the other through an oversized hole with just a little bit of slop in it. 
and that slot lets me dial in square. Um, not every time, maybe every few times I use it, I'll just double check. <clears throat> and now with this taller fence, I have the backup I need to prevent blowout. And this type of tool, it does take a little bit of uh, technique in that what I'm doing is there's downward pressure on the plane and it's riding, this bottom is riding against the edge, but mainly the plane is really grounded on that lip. And what I don't want to do is push the plane into the workpiece. I really want to feed the workpiece into the plane. I also don't want to start with the workpiece hanging out, is that um, it's hard to make sure we're going to stay square, and I can end up with tear out on that little corner that's unsupported. So bring your plane up flush to the edge of the shooting board. Bring your workpiece up flush to the sole just ahead of the blade. Now um, it's in line with this piece. Now, are you cutting the shooting board a little bit with the plane? I know that bottom board. The first time you use it, you will. But after that, um, you're not cutting below the, the width of the blade. So really, um, it's just that bottom edge is riding against it, which is why you don't want to push into it, because it's just a little lip um, which keeps you from going. If you're planing and you ever hear your fence, it means you're, you're pushing in too much. And I use this for end grain. Um, the low angle does cut better, so that is a good thing. More importantly, when you're planing sort of thin pieces of end grain, you put a lot of wear and tear on sort of narrow areas of your blade. So you can sharpen your smoother, but once you're planing the ends of a bunch of drawer parts, you need to resharpen again. So this poor guy, this is his job, is just to sit here and do end grain all day long. And it's end grain, it doesn't need to be sharp, sharp. So this, he's happy doing that, and my smoothers are happy doing what they're doing. So um, for doing sort of like picture frame miters, this is a uh, invention of my buddy Sean in Raleigh. He came up with the idea of using a T-square adding a little wooden fence to it, running a groove in a shooting board. And it's actually really accurate. That's set up a little heavy. Not elegant in my technique, but it does a good job. Um, and there is just enough slop Actually, it's pretty tight, but there's a little bit of slop in the groove, and just by adjusting the fence, if you need to sort of micro-adjust that 45, you can do it by slight adjustments to the fence to dial that in. Speed squares are amazingly accurate, which I never thought that they would be. And the other type of miter is more like for miter boxes or liners, where something like this is not going to work. I used to try to figure out a way to hold up the stock at 45 degrees to plane it. And instead I figured out that... How did you touch the wood to the speed square? But, oh, um, it's a rabbit. Rabbited piece of stock. And then I super glued it first to hold it in place and then drilled through it. That's why I use the plastic speed square instead of the steel one. And you also have to cut off the tip of the speed square too. So this shooting board, it's basically a shooting board with an angled fence on it. So the plane basically is registered at a 45 degree angle. And that's really cool because what that lets me do is it lets me plane, put my stock down flat on the workbench. Move it right up to the fence. And it's really supported because a lot of times I'll do um, uh, boxes with mitered linings and partitions and sometimes these liners are maybe six inches wide and really flexible they're really thin and having it bedded firmly on a jig like this lets me tackle that really easily um, actually in our 
current issue that either just came out or is coming out, um, we have an article on making this. His is a lot fancier than mine, but um, this works really well. So get the gunk off, file the bottom, get your blade sharp, get it set up to take a cut, and now you're up with Vic making beautiful shavings. So thanks very much.